on this episode of Weather Watch. We get an in-depth look at the Oklahoma tragedy that hit back in mid-May. Then, we kick off our countdown of the top five hurricanes since the 1990s. And finally, we take a look at some mysterious occurrences in meteorology. All that and more on this episode of Weather Watch. Welcome to Weather Watch, Millersville University's exclusive weather news program. I'm your host, TJ Springer. As you may know, we were off the air for the summer season, so we need to take this time to get you caught up on the weather that has made headlines from around the globe. Here is a special two-minute edition of Your Weather in 60 Seconds. Blustering winds in Britain, a typhoon in Japan, and a tornado outbreak in the Midwest are all on tap for this special edition of Weather in 60 Seconds. Crossing the pond over to Britain where their shores were battered by 70 mile per hour winds and heavy rain. The winds accompanied over two and a half inches of rain. These storms brought unseasonable temperatures for this time of year. Temperatures fell into the mid-teens in some parts but dropped as low as 10 degrees just north of Scotland. Even some wintry weather hit the highlands. Flying over to Japan, where hundreds of thousands of people had to evacuate due to a massive typhoon, Typhoon Man-Yi struck the mainland, packing gusts well over 100 miles per hour and doubled the region's annual rainfall. Two people were found dead and many more were injured. The typhoon forced over 260,000 people to evacuate. Heading back over to Europe, where over the summer, they experienced their hottest summer since 2007. The prolonged heat wave lasted from July 3rd all the way to July 22nd which finished about ninth warmest in the record books for the nation, dating back to 1910. Rain was also well below average, making it the driest summer since 2006. Moving over to Mexico, where its shores were hammered from both the west and the east by two tropical systems. Tropical Storm Manuel and Tropical Storm Ingrid hit both coasts of Mexico. The government called the results the worst weather crisis since 1958, when it was also hit by two storms on separate coasts. The two cyclones killed over 80 and left people stranded in places like Acapulco for days. Tourists struggled to get home. Heading north into the Midwest, where a city in Kansas was destroyed by a slow-moving but powerful storm system that produced several strong tornadoes across the Great Plains. 27 fatalities were recorded in total, with nine resulting from tornadoes. The strongest of the outbreak was an EF4 tornado, which touched down in Bennington, Kansas on May 28th which executed a cyclonic loop around Ottawa County. The tornado was on the ground for over an hour with wind gusts well over 200 miles per hour and sustained winds of around 180 miles per hour. It lifted just southwest of where it touched down, leaving widespread damage all around the county. And that will do it for this special two minute edition of Your Weather in 60 Seconds. Last season, our own Pete Mullinex investigated the top five severe weather outbreaks across the United States. This season, Weather Watch's Rosa Brothman counts us down to our number one hurricane from the 1990s up through the present. Welcome back to another season of Weather Watch's Top Five. Last season, we count down from the top five severe weather outbreaks. This season will be counting down from the top five hurricanes to occur in the United States since 1990. A hurricane is a low pressure system that moves in a counterclockwise rotation. These storms are classified using a category one to a category five on the Saffir Simpson scale. Don't be surprised to find that not all these storms make landfall as a category five. And number five on our countdown, Hurricane Wilma. Hurricane Wilma was born in the Caribbean Sea near Jamaica. Beginning as a tropical depression on October 15th, it was the 24th tropical system of the 2005 hurricane season. After she caused damage in multiple areas, claiming homes and lives for 12 days, 
She began to diminish over the Atlantic Ocean on October 26. She was the most intense tropical cyclone ever recorded in the Atlantic Basin, with her highest winds recorded at 183 miles per hour and her lowest pressure being at 882 millibars. Wilma had affected over 14 areas, but the areas that got the real brunt of the storm were the Yucatan Peninsula of Mexico and southern Florida. Wilma first hit Cosmo, Mexico on October 21st as a slow-moving Category 4 hurricane. Isla Mujeres received over 62 inches of rain in one day. After Wilma devastated the Yucatan, she moved through the Gulf of Mexico and quickly regained energy and set her sights on Cape Romano, Florida, making landfalls a Category 3 hurricane and causing in total $20.6 billion in damage. Due to Wilma's acceleration, she caused minimal rain damage but caused a devastating storm surge and beach erosion. From her strong winds, she managed to cause the largest electrical service disruption ever in Florida, causing 98% of Southern Florida to be without power. The total insurance claims totaled $209 million in Monroe County, Florida. Reporting for WeatherWatch, I'm City Meteorologist Rosa Brothman. Thanks, Rosa. Devastation struck Oklahoma back in mid-May due to a series of tornadoes that crossed the Midwest. Oklahoma was in shambles due to the massive twisters. People were left homeless and stranded. WeatherWatch's Curtis Silverwood gives you a first-hand look of the Oklahoma tragedy. More 911, where is your emergency? Oh my God! Okay, you need to get in shelter. We got, we got some of babies in here. May 20th, 2013. A massive two mile wide tornado tore through Oklahoma, leaving nothing in its path. Elementary schools flattened, hospitals leveled, debris everywhere. A total of 51 deaths, 20 of them children. A devastating natural disaster that changed the lives of the people in the region and left the nation remembering that weather can be a powerful force. On that devastating day in May, the whole state of Oklahoma seemed to be in a panic. News broadcasts were constantly keeping the nation up to date on the effects of the tornadoes through Oklahoma City. President Obama declared a major disaster area in Oklahoma and sent federal aid to support state and local efforts after an EF5 tornado with wind speeds peaking to an estimate of 210 miles per hour ripped through Oklahoma City and the surrounding suburbs in Moore. The tornado was part of a larger storm system that had produced several other tornadoes over the previous two days. The twister touched down west of Newcastle, staying grounded for 39 minutes over a 17-mile path, crossing through the heavily populated section of Moore. Along its path, it reached Briarwood and Plaza Towers Elementary School. Briarwood was completely destroyed in a direct hit from the tornado. Plaza Towers suffered a loss of seven of their students. One little girl told how she clung to her school desk as a tornado roared through the small town. One rescuer broke down as he told how they lifted a car to find one teacher underneath using her body to cover three children. Parents of missing children drew tears as most were reunited with their sons or daughters. President Obama visited the site after the storm and also broke down in tears and said the damage was hard to comprehend. The tornado caused an estimated $2 billion in damage. Witnesses said the tornado resembled a giant black wall of destruction. Besides the destruction of the elementary schools, one family farm lost numerous horses when it hit the training center. The storm caused much turmoil and had even government officials of other countries sending their condolences. The tornado was the deadliest to hit since the Joplin, Missouri tornado two years ago. The governor of Oklahoma declared a state of emergency and sent out teams to help and organize rescue efforts. Many organizations and celebrities offered donations to relief efforts. Those of Oklahoma are still working today to rebuild their homes and lives. The Oklahoma tragedy that caused so much heartache and brought a city closer together than ever before. 
a nation's leader to tears and will have the people of this country remembering this disaster for a lifetime. Reporting for WeatherWatch, I'm student meteorologist Curtis Silverwood. Go to our website, muweatherwatch.com, to learn about what you can do to help the tornado victims. Thanks, Curtis. Weather has been a key component in history. In WeatherWatch's new segment, Blast from the Past, the history of meteorology, we will give you an in-depth look at these moments that have made meteorology what it is today. For hundreds of years, mankind has been fascinated by severe weather. In this segment, we will explore the origins and development of tornado tracking. The groundwork for early tornado forecasting was established in 1882 by Sergeant Finley of the United States Army Signal Corps. He published 15 rules outlining the signs of possible tornado formation. Over the next several years, research progressed and radar imaging was introduced to weather forecasting during World War II. By this point, forecasters were able to better identify areas where severe storms could develop, but they were still unable to pinpoint an exact time or location. A breakthrough occurred in the late 1940s when Major Fawbush and Captain Miller of the United States Air Force recognized patterns in tornado formation and issued the first successful tornado forecast before the storm struck. In 1953, the Severe Local Storm Center was established within the Weather Bureau. They developed parameters for tornado forecasting based off of the research of Fawbush and Miller. It was known as the Lifted Index and became the building block for determining atmospheric instability for years to come. Around 1972, Dr. T. Theodore Fujita introduced the F scale. The damage caused by tornadoes was used to determine the wind speed of the storm, placing it on a scale from F0 to F5. This scale has since been used as a foundation for evaluating all tornadoes. In 2007, the F scale was replaced by a more refined version known as the Enhanced Fujita Scale. Advancements in technology have enabled forecasters to better track and predict tornado formation in present day and for years to come. For WeatherWatch, I'm student meteorologist Melanie Reagan. Have you ever wondered why darker objects get hotter out in the sun? In meteorological terms, this is known as albedo. In this installment of Weather 101, we investigate why this happens. Have you ever stopped to think during the summer why the street is much hotter than the sidewalk? Or why snow on the ground on a sunny day appears so bright? This phenomenon is called albedo. Albedo can be described as the amount of radiation that is reflected back into space, or more simply, reflectivity. Reflectivity is based on a scale between 0 and 1, where 0 stands for all the radiation that is absorbed, and 1 stands for all the radiation that is reflected. The closer the number is to 0, the more radiation it will absorb, and hence feeling warmer. The closer to 1, the more radiation will be reflected, and the object will feel cooler. When walking on blacktop during a hot day, stepping on fresh asphalt will cause some of it to stick to your shoe. This is because it was heated by the sun and melted more quickly than the surrounding worn asphalt due to its lower albedo. On the other hand, during the day when many clouds are present, the temperatures may be slightly cooler. This is due to the clouds having a high albedo, which reflects most of the sun's warming energy back into space. In the winter, despite the sun being at a lower angle in the sky, it can seem very bright outside. During the day, you may need sunglasses, and at night, there still seems to be a glow in the sky. This is because snow and other wintry mixes have a high albedo and act as a dull mirror. That is why snowy, wintry days may appear brighter despite less daily sunshine. Albedo is a fancy word for the reflectiveness of a surface to send radiation back into space. Now you know more about what albedo is. For WeatherWatch, I'm John Burley, and this has been your Weather 101. Weather is a puzzling phenomenon, somewhat unpredictable and changing all the time. This motivated the crew of WeatherWatch to dive deeper into some perplexing weather mysteries. 
Most people know of the old sailor saying, red skies at night, sailors delight. Red skies in the morning, sailors warning. Sailors thought by looking at the sky's color in the evening and in the morning that it would help them predict when storms would hit so they knew when to set sail. However, did you know that this old lore actually has some truth to it? The colors we see in the sky are due to rays of sunlight splitting into the colors of the spectrum as they pass through the atmosphere, bouncing off of water vapor and dust in the sky. These particulates and the water vapor can help indicate weather conditions. When we see a red sky at night, this means that the setting sun is sending its light through a high concentration of dust particles. This usually indicates high pressure and stable air coming in from the west. Therefore, you would expect to experience calm conditions and have clear skies. If there is a red sunrise, it means the sun's rays reflect the dust particles of a system that has just passed from the west. This indicates that a storm system may be moving to the east. If the morning sky is a deep fiery red, it means high water content is in the atmosphere. This will result in a rainy day to follow. Sailors found this pattern to be true most of the time, so they used it to their advantage when they tried to go out to sea. Little did they know, they were one of the first forecasters of our time. Reporting for WeatherWatch, I'm student meteorologist Alex Engard. That's about all we have for this episode of WeatherWatch. Please be sure to follow us on Twitter and like us on Facebook at the addresses shown below. Also, be sure to check out our website, muweatherwatch.com, to see our entire collection of episodes. On behalf of the entire cast and crew, I'm your host, TJ Springer. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.